So it's Greg Searle who's joined me, Martin Cross, and uh, we're going to talk about all things driving and a little bit more for the next little bit. Don't know how long we're going to be up. I guess that depends how much energy we've got. Um, for those of you that don't know who I am, I'm a uh, World Rowing's TV commentator with Greg, and both of us have rowed in the British rowing team, British Olympic team, and we're very interested in what's going on at the moment. Greg, you seem to have shorter hair than when I saw you last. Yeah, I do have shorter hair. We, you and I should have been at World Cup too now, shouldn't we, doing some commentating on the rowing out there. And um, beautiful Varese. Yeah, yeah, love that. Know, yeah, love Varese. Love Varese. One of my favourite training camps, always Varese was. Um, yeah. No, in terms of the hair, yeah, it's um, someone called me out to do it for the NHS. Um, and then I did it this weekend at 2.6. So grade two on the sides and three on the top. I was never good at maths, but that's probably about 2.6. <laughs> All over. You, you're looking keen and mean. Are you Are you still able to do any ex exercise in lockdown? Well, I tell you what, I'm doing Joe Wicks every day. Um, you're kidding? No, I love it. I absolutely love Joe Wicks exercises. Um, I mean, he was doing it with his um, with little Indy, his two-year-old today. And you can see it's quite hard to get toddlers to do it. But I've managed to get my wife to do it. Um, my kids have more or less packed in. They're 17 and 90. But now I've done it every single day, except the very first day. But as soon as I heard of it, I mean, just hit training half a, half an hour a day seems great to me. Yeah, it's fantastic. I'm on, I'm on uh, between half an hour and hour today. On an, I've got, sort of got an exercise bike, um, took out of the boathouse, which I use. Um, I'm doing kind of one arm rowing ergometers as well, a little bit. Yeah, and run. Why one arm. I've got tennis elbow. Oh, so you're trying to row with your good arm? Yeah, and I, I, I it's try. Not night, aren't you? They're yeah. going to stop Martin Cross. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Um, yeah. We've got two viewers that have joined us, which is very nice and and great to see. Welcome to be on this um, live stream, Martin and Greg, talking about all things rowing. Um, Greg, uh, British rowing team, I think we could talk of. I We don't really know what the British rowing team might have looked like, although we've kind of got some pointers. Um, I was talking to Ollie Cook, the guy out the the British four, yeah. and um, he told me he was told the four was selected. Definitely you were going to the Olympics, the men's four, which was the same crew as last year which I thought was kind of interesting because I kind of wondered whether the four was the top boat. I mean, two of the guys from the four won the pairs trials, beat Mo Sabihi. What do you yeah, make of that? Call? I saw that, although we didn't get to see much of the GB trials, did we? Very much cloak and dagger behind closed doors. Um, I think it has to go back on the drawing board to me. Um, that I think it's a really interesting and difficult time for, for rowers of the world. Um, and with Tokyo moving, um, I've been chatting to a few of the team now, and I would have thought they don't want to be doing anything to do with rowing right now. They want to be doing a bit of Joe Wicks or a bit of, you know, looking after their bodies, but get away from the sport and do something different. And I think this needs to be a real opportunity to round your life out and do some other stuff with your life if you possibly can, and then be ready to return to training I don't know, sometime in, you know, after lockdown. It's it's really interesting that because, you know, you've got other nations around the world. Um, I, I think, I don't know, I think Paul Thompson was on a, a good interview actually with Martin McElroy the other day. Um, and he's training with the Chinese team um, in between Beijing and Shanghai on the coast. They've got a rowing course there. And I guess the Chinese rigorously tested and all that. They're rowing, I would think. And the Germans are out in pairs. They sort of go down, two of them go down by themselves for an outing and they have an outing, then another two can go down and all the rest of it. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's interesting what other nations uh, are starting to do. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, you know, I, I talk to companies about lessons you learn from sport and how you take them into business. And I thought Rio was a really interesting one because it was difficult. Um, because Everything in, in Rio, you know, the transport, the setup of the village, the water were all going to be diff difficult and turned out to be difficult. And so therefore, it's for me all about how you handle difficulty 
which makes the difference that, you know, going into Rio, you probably weren't going to go and set world best times, but you had to say, how can you perform at your best in those circumstances? And to me, this whole Olympic delay is a massive distraction, which I would have thought you've got to say, well, if it's 15 months till the Olympic Games, how do you use the next 15 months as well as possible? And forget about 2020, you know, just just totally forget about 2020 and go, what does the perfect build up look like from now? And like I say to me, I don't think that would involve that much rowing right now. Certainly not for the British team because it's so difficult. But I don't think you want to be in your garage beasting yourself on your rowing machine. I think you should be looking at your CV, looking at your network, looking when I say CV, you know, your job after rowing your relationships outside of rowing because now is such a special time really to look at your life in a bigger picture than just the rowing team that's a really interesting perspective greg i'm just wondering how much you know rowers need routine and the programs coming out there and just in this particular you know very difficult time the routine of being on the ergo is just giving them something and i don't know what their incentive is to look outside. I mean, that would be great advice if some of them were getting it. Yeah. I mean, and it has to be a culture, doesn't it? If one person goes and becomes unfit, you find yourself getting dropped. Um, so you'd be terrified to go against the grain of what everyone else is doing. Um, but I feel like it's now time for a very individualised programme. I mean, you carried on, you know, well into a sort of into your 30s into your 40s rowing i did into my 40s i think the need for individualized training for each athlete is so important right now um and to just have a, a sort of broad brush i'm not saying this is what's happening but to have a sort of broad brush training program you you know you must do the program and for someone to be sending out sessions and everyone to be sort of slavishly doing those sessions I don't feel like that's a very good way forward. Yeah, you know, talking again to Ollie Cook, I mean, he was mentioning lads who were injured. I, I think Josh Bigowski, who was in the British Eight last year, um, must have had an injury this winter. Um, this is this is not something I know, but just that um, <clears throat> Ollie Cook had mentioned. And so it didn't look like Josh was going to be in the Olympic team or the Olympic Eight. But, of course, now he's given this opportunity yeah. You know, why wouldn't he beast himself and just try and get back up on the erg? Oh, well, I think, I mean, again, it depends how broad minded your coaches are going to be. Um, I mean, when you look at the, the GB team specifically, you know, the results at the World Championships in Linz, we were there last year, um, looked like a clear strategy to try and qualify as many boats as possible. So the talent seemed to be broad but the peaks weren't there in the way they have been in previous Olympiads. So Team GB is going to have to do something different in order to win gold medals, I think, in Tokyo. And I would have thought that could involve new talent coming into the team. You know, the under-23s were fantastic. Yeah, they were. Um, so to say, how can you bring in new talent? Again, you and I both had long careers. How old were you, how old were you in Moscow, about 22? Yeah, 22, 23. Had my birthday at the Games. Yeah, right. And I was 20 in Barcelona. So, you know, there's people who must be in that under-23 team who certainly, I would have thought, deserve to be looked at. And if the team wants to be successful, they need to be looking at. Yeah. And so, I mean, looking at that race, you know, let's let's take a broader look at, at the World Cup scene because we haven't seen anyone really race since the World Championships last year. But you mentioned the British Eight going down the boats, that final last year with Germany just holding off Holland. Holland have integrated those, you know, youngsters, uh, Herkmans, Van Dorp, into their men's eight. The British eight, I'm just looking at the uh, the timesheet now, were, well, a good sort of 2.5 seconds off the Netherlands, who were quite close to Germany. Yeah. Um, Australia. The were spectacular, weren't they? At the World yeah. Championships last year, the Netherlands looked like they'd really got something right in that build-up to Linz. Um, which is fantastic for Linz. You worry about whether, well, you ask the question, how do you keep that going? And particularly how you keep that going now that you've got this massive distraction. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine the Germans are going to start anyone's favourites because they seem to have 
you know, come up against any hurdle. Lastly, the Dutch A, and they've managed to hold them off. But I would have said the Dutch had their guys home from, you know, the, the US universities training and um, they were really slick. And I'd see it was quite difficult for a British eight to get in that, that medal zone. You know, they were a length off it um, ahead of the Australians. But, you know, I'm not sure I would say, OK, British eight's going to win a gold medal, but I'm sure that's what Jürgen will be going for with them. Yeah, no, I agree with you as well, Martin, that I think, if the Great Britain team aren't getting at least one gold from the men and one gold from the women, then they'll not see that as a very successful Olympic campaign. And I think that's that's bare minimum, really. So massive question as to whether you try and go for that in the eight. But if you're not going the eight, you've got the pair or the four, really, with the sweep side. I think that the GB men's scholars are another story that we could perhaps speak about in a minute. I'm not sure I would be saying, let's go up against the German eight and try and turn over the German eight, having seen what we saw at the World Championships last year. Yeah. And then looking at the four, because it is going to be the same four. I mean, that crew last year, they got a bronze medal, They the British four, they won the European Championships. But they came up against the kind of resurgent Polish crew and those young Romanians who don't have very big scores on the Rhine machine. Uh, I think I'm just looking at the splits here of that race, Greg. The Romanians, uh, the, the British were in second place going into the last quarter, but the Romanians just came straight through. And the Australians, if you remember, out the back. So just I wheel think, spinning along, weren't they? Yeah, I think that I can't imagine the Australians going to make the same mistake again. The American four with um, Clark Dean in that. Stroke. I mean, the youngster, he's going to have a lot, you know, to give. Maybe Tati might have him in the eight or not. The Italians are out of the picture, but that's going to be such a difficult event to win a goal. But they do say that the four relative is the slowest event. Um, Greg, we're just getting um, very nice of you to join us on this on this broadcast from Sahel Dawan to ask our opinions of the Kiwi eight. Should we just take the question on the four and then we'll talk about the Kiwi eight a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Let's do that. Um, with the four, I think the four is an open event. Um, and I don't mean disrespect to the Polish um, and to those young Romanians and the British what, relatively young crew in there. Um, I would have thought this is the, the race where you would be putting your, your strongest sweep oared rowers with the best chance of winning a, a gold medal. Now, I don't know um, who the strongest British rowers are because it's all behind closed doors and like you say I'm not close enough to it I think that crew will probably need to change again you know what was set up for the World Cup season 2020 and then Tokyo 2020 will be different for 21 it's got to be people coming back from injuries people developing um, developing strength and talent coming through the system but to me the four is the place to put your talent if you want to win a gold yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. And I, I think it'll be the top Australian boat again. And, I, you know, I reckon they won't be going over at 41, 42, 43. I agree. And no. before we move on to the Kiwi 8, the Sinkovich brothers in the pair, um, this is difficult for them. You know, can they keep, you know, how are they going to be able to handle another year in this boat? We know about the injuries they've had. Um, it's difficult. So I would say that, again, I think that the power and the, the, the history of the German 8 for me, is the most consistent and the, the most likely to, to be repeated when we get to, to the Olympic Games. That's, the that's really, four would be easier, I think. Yeah, that's really interesting. Now, the Kiwi 8, Sahil, you've asked us about that. And, of course, last year they were in that final last year and uh, didn't manage to qualify. They finished sixth with Mahe Drysdale on board. Mahe Drysdale has now been selected or was selected in the men's single. I did see a blog from Mahe saying he was totally demotivated just after the announcement of the postponement was made. He was going really well in his single and then just everything sort of fell apart and he thought, could I could I do another year and a bit to the Tokyo Olympics? But um, the only thing I've heard, Greg, via, um, via New Zealand, a bit of a bush telegraph, is the, the Kiwi 8 are going fast. Yeah, Um Again, and I, I don't have intel on the on the Kiwi 8. I did see Mahe um, training at Eton Dorney 
uh, with Robin Williams coaching him, um, which was fan, which was amazing. Um, just when was before that? we went into lockdown, yeah, just before we went into lockdown, Mahe was in the UK training. Um, so I don't know if he was getting ready for a um, for the the winter the the season over here in Europe. Um, just getting used to conditions and used to being up here. Um, but he was in really good spirits. Um, really looking forward to racing, you know, in New Zealand racing over here. Um, and uh, like you say, he's you know he's not young, is he? For him to put on another year. Um, at that stage of your career, it's a big ask to do another 15 months. When you're 23 years old, it's not a big ask to do another 15 months to get to the Olympics. I did, um, just talking about Mahe in the New Zealand eight, I mean, you, you think on the surface it would be slower without a guy of, of his calibre. Um, but I asked, um, I was doing a kind of fantasy rowing team from, you know, sort of year dot, who would you have in the best sort of Olympic teams? And I ended up putting Mahe Drysdale in the in the in this sort of all star four, um, and um, because he rode in the four actually in two thousand and four Olympics he was in the men's four, yeah. and yeah. Eric Murray came back to me on on social media and said, "What the hell have you put Mahe in there? He's just going to slow that right down." You know, as if to say. And I just wonder maybe if the New Zealand Day are going quick. They're clearly, you know, out to qualify. Um, you know, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think the Italians were still got to qualify. The Poles, the Canadian eight as well, because they went for the top eight. It's quite a tight field that you would think would would try and get to the Tokyo Olympics. Yeah, um, it is a tight field, but it's also tight from the bottom. You know, winning the small final probably still has you within. What four or five seconds of winning the gold, winning the A final, if not closer. So if you can put on a turn of speed and get quick enough um, to be qualifying, then um, you could certainly be challenging for medals um, at the Olympic Games. Um, so I don't think you know not having qualified and not being one of the fastest six last year doesn't rule you out of a medal by any by any measure. Um, the other thing I would say, and it's a broader term really, is that often good individuals don't make eights go quickly. Um, I'm sure we must have both experienced sometimes that happening, sometimes it didn't. Um, I'm remembering really when I got into the eight in 2010, um, the eight was the, the weakest boat in the team. Um, likewise, when you and I did it in 1991, my first year, um, we were pretty much at the bottom of the team. Yeah. And yet, we had something special. Um, we had trust and we had, uh, you know, a real, what can I say, sort of mutual accountability for what we were doing. We didn't rely on anyone to pull us along. Um, and, you know, we shared, we shared every conversation. People weren't afraid to speak up when we had our crew debriefs and all those kind of things. And I think sometimes if you put one strong character in it, everyone relies on that person's opinion about why the eight's going fast or why the eight's going slow and doesn't necessarily have as much input as they need to. And so that's why I think a strong person who might be, you know, whatever, a little bit quicker on the rowing machine, a little bit quicker in their single, doesn't necessarily make an eight go quicker because effectively they stop everyone else being as good as they could be. I know, I know, Greg, we've talked about you when you came back and your fantastic comeback between 2010 and 2012. And you had some views on the eight where you got very close to the Germans. I think the closest in that Olympiad in 2010. Yeah. That crew compared to um, your 2012 eight where you actually led the Germans. We might have a little look at the clip of that race in, in just a moment. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. 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 Um, no, I mean, the 2010 eight, we really established um, four key words that defined how we wanted to row and how we wanted to be off the water. And we all bought into it, signed up to it. Um, and it was a, you know, it was a real kind of mantra for us to use all of the time. Um, and when we started changing the crew and putting in stronger athletes on paper, we didn't really sign up to how we were moving the boat and how we were carrying ourselves off the water. 
And when we didn't carry ourselves off the water as well, we didn't carry ourselves on the water as well. And I think the results didn't um, didn't add up to the sum of the parts, really. OK, well, I don't know if my technology is going to work because I'm new on this system. But um, one, one of the things I've got in terms of is that eight, that magical race. It was a, you know, it was a sensational race to watch. Um, and um, I'm just going to have a look and see if we can maybe get this race in from a thousand metres and, um, and get you talking us through it, perhaps. Yeah, I won't put you off while you fiddle with the technology. But, um... no. Can you see that, Greg? Something. Yeah, here we go. So, yeah, this is uh, the Olympic final, I can see. Yeah, so yeah, I think this is, this is just before a thousand meters. So I'll I'll turn the sound down on it and uh Yeah, okay. So we'll maybe um, just have a little bit of sound. So Greg, coming through coming through that point. In the race, you're just coming up to a thousand meters, I guess. Germans out in the lead. What was going on in the boat then? Well, we were very, very disciplined on keeping our eyes down the boat and not looking out. Um, and I mean, it's a real shame that we're separated by two lanes from the Germans because um, I really wasn't aware of where we were relative to them. But I was really aware that we moved very nicely on the cruise either side of us, which was the Dutch and the Americans. So to take half a length off any eight, I knew we were in pretty good shape. Um, the lovely thing about Dorney at this point was that the crowd was still um, another 750 metres away. So I could hear Phelan Hill in the back of the boat. And somewhere around here in this third quarter, we knew we had to give our biggest effort. Um, and I remember it was around here where we were going to take the lead. But I remember him calling something. In the lead there, Greg. Yeah, I know. Coming through about 12.50, we take the lead. I remember Phelan Hill calling out the names of my kids, calling jo Josie and Adam's name um, somewhere here, and I knew they were in the crowd at the finish. Um, and again, I could only tell that we were in the lead from the tone of his voice, and I could tell that we were genuinely taking the lead. And he was he was probably telling us, you know, that he was now ahead of Martin Sauer in their Cox's seat, was, was sitting with the stroke man. So I knew we had the lead at this point. Um, and unfortunately, all I could tell was then he stopped saying we was move, we were moving further ahead. So I had to just assume we weren't breaking the German eight. We, we'd made our big move, thrown everything in, um, taken the lead, but we weren't moving on them as we come now, as you can see, with 500 to go. And, and really, we were just treating this as a 1,500 metre race. Um, we weren't really bothered about Canada or the Americans. Um, as far as we were concerned, there was only two places to finish. It was either first or last. Um, there, was, there was gold or there was nothing. Um, so we threw everything at the Germans in that third quarter. Um, here we haven't quite got to the stand. So I remember I could still hear Phelan, but I could tell that we probably weren't ahead of the Germans anymore because I'd had his excitement. And now you can see we hit the crowd. And... It, it's impossible to hear anything at all from the cocks in the back of the boat. And actually from here, I mean, you can see that's 2.50 to go. We go backwards incredibly quickly. Um, you won't see a boat lose three quarters of the length as fast as you see us lose it um, in what is only 20 strokes, really, between here and the line. And that's because we're absolutely spent because everything was about the third quarter and getting in front. Doesn't help that it's a classic dawny day and it's a cross headwind. So, you know, everything we thought means the race should be finishing right now. But there's another 20 strokes to go or, you know, 15 strokes to go. And this has turned into a very, very long race and an even longer last 500 for us. And here, I've got no idea, really. I'm just focused on following Matt Langridge in front of me. Um, I have honestly no idea where we finish. I didn't know if those Dutch and Americans had overtaken us. I knew it wasn't a good thing because they come back at us that much. So I, I had a strong feeling that wasn't a good thing. And then actually I remember sitting there after the finish line and bobbing about in the water. And uh, it immediately came up that Germany had got the gold and Canada had got the second and didn't say who'd got the bronze because it was obviously a photo finish. Greg, um, I'm just going to check. Can you hear me? 
I can hear you, yeah. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. You can't hear me? you check your mic? Um, I don't know how to check my mic. I haven't touched anything. Fantastic pulsating edge of the seat final. Germany I think you can only hear the commentary in the race. I guess you must have to stop Oh, I think I turned my laptop down so I couldn't see you. I mean, that was so I couldn't hear you. Yeah. I can hear you now. Just give me three yeah. things that you were saying during that race because I could see you talking your way through it. <laughs> so what came out for you watching it? Um, what came back was that I'm happy with how we raced, which was we were either going to win gold or we were going to lose. Um, and in that third quarter, we did absolutely everything to try and get in front of the Germans, which we did. Um, as it was, the Germans were strong enough to, to come back and we weren't quick enough to move on the rest of the field. Um, it probably didn't help that it was an Eton Dorney headwind and an Eton Dorney cross headwind because the race ended up being, you know, whatever that was, about 550 rather than 520 because the last 250 metres we lost an incredible amount um, because we were all done. I mean, we were absolutely done with 250 to go. And it was all we could do just to get to the finish line. Have you ever gone as hard in a race as you did in that third quarter? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think I went that hard every race. <laughs> <Did> <laughs> I can't think of many races when I didn't go that hard. Um, I... Hopefully. I think one of the things that's fascinating about that race was just how members of the crew reacted differently to it. And, you know, uh, even some of the stories since then, you know, you, you hear about Fody and his, the psychological problems he'd, he'd had Alex Partridge as well. You know, I remember talking to Stan Leloudis immediately after he, he couldn't really look at his bronze medal. Um, it, it was, I think a real, you know, example of a crew that had just put everything out there but didn't know how to deal with the result. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I think we we all felt like we'd lost when we got a bronze medal. Um, I think I saw the success of a, of a bronze medal, you know, the third in the world side of it more quickly than others in that crew. And I can't help being a little bit guilty for that. Um, but I think it's something that comes with age and having been at the end of my career rather than midway through or the beginning. Um, you know, I you were probably there for Atlanta when I got got bronze mm. in Atlanta games, and I was absolutely gutted. Um, this this bronze, I felt, and I do feel incredibly much more satisfied and happy with because of the way we raced it, um, and I suppose because of what it meant to me and my family in a bigger picture than just being a rowing race. Yeah. Thanks for everyone that's joined us on this live stream with me, Marty Cross, talking to Greg Searle about all things rowing. Greg, we ought to look at the women's um, events that would have been happening in World Cup 2 this weekend. I'm starting off with the women's eights. I mean, those Kiwis, Prendergrass and Gowler in the eight, the sort of, you know, the engine room in the middle of that eight and also winning the women's pairs, you know, phenomenal regatta for them. And the Americans back in bronze medal position, that new Australian eight coached by John Keogh coming into the mix with their pair, Mac, uh, Morrison and McIntyre, um, really shaking things up. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the New Zealanders were very impressive throughout that regatta, really. Crew of the year, they were made in the end, weren't they? Yeah. Um, that, that women And the, the way that women's eight performed, um, they just looked the part, I thought. They came to Henley... Um, and raced earlier in the year and they were they were very relaxed and able to enjoy the event um, but when it came to getting on the water they they just had a sort of composure about them I thought on and off the water um, that they didn't I mean they look they look athletic they don't look so so big as some other crews that you see but I thought that didn't hold them back um, because they were very athletic very dynamic composed um, you know, so whatever they didn't have in, in raw power, they made up for, I think, with how well they, they rode the eight. Yeah, that's a great shout. I mean, they won that eight by uh, quite a margin, I think, uh, over a length from the Australians. So it was, it was a decent result. 
And then another person who turned in a domin dominant performance, um, Sunita Prospera in the women's single skulls for Ireland, beating Emma Twig, the New Zealander, and Cara Cola from, from USA. And, uh, well, would it be the first Irish medal for Sunita Prospera in the Tokyo Olympics in, in a single skull? I mean, it'd be wonderful if she did um, for, for the Republic of Ireland um, and for her and, and for her family. Um, I think we know she went through quite a lot last year, but she was so driven um, every time we saw her competing. Um, and I think it was fantastic just seeing her really take her event, you know, take hold of her event. And she wanted to dominate. It was the semi-final, wasn't it, where she just kept going and going yeah. to the finish line, yeah. um, moving on the rest of the field when the race was, was very much won. But she was just sending out a message and maybe just testing herself over the full, the full distance. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the extra year probably won't help her. Um, because she was on such a high last year in terms of her performance. But then again, from an emotional family point of view and everything else, maybe it's good for her to be able to, to just take some time yeah, to do sure. other things as well as growing in her life. Just getting comments, Greg, from um, people that are watching the live stream from Luke Kelly, talking about your eighth race. He said it was an amazing race to watch, an absolute testament to the attitude and grit of the British to race all or nothing will always be an inspiration, even if it wasn't the result you wanted, which is pretty yeah. strong, really, isn't it? No, it's pretty special. I mean, there's there's what you do, but there's also how you do it, isn't there? And I yeah. think we were all happy with how we did it, um, that we all agreed we wanted to take the race on like that. Um, I mean, you wonder in hindsight whether we might have thought differently when you look at the headwind and the fact it was going to be so long. Um, and whether to really go as hard as we did, as early as we did, um, was wise compared to Canada, who seemed to really have a lot, make a, so yeah. much on us in the last 500. And you wonder how they might have kind of kept a more, what can I say, sustainable pace through the middle thousand. Whereas really in the middle thousand, we were trying to overhaul the Germans for the whole yeah. Um Just with the women's team, just thinking about, yeah. China, um, you know, striking. I mean, they won the men's double skulls, which came didn't come out of nowhere, but they'd had a pretty up and down season that Chinese men's double. But the women's quadruple were extremely yeah. dominant. I mean, they won by a length from the poles, who were a pretty slick crew, and the Dutch also a very strong crew with some Olympic silver medalists. The Germans back in in fourth place. It, it's a really impressive testament to what's happening with the Chinese team and difficult to see who might get in front of that Chinese quad. Yeah, no, it was difficult to see. Again, on last year, they were one of those dominant crews, weren't they? Um, yeah. the, again, and they looked, they, you know, they looked to be sculling so well. Um, you think about Paul Thompson um, and what it must feel like to him to have left the British team and now to go out there and get hold of those Chinese athletes um, and see what an impact he's done there. Um, with Steve Redgrave um, and Tom Kay um, and the rest of the team that they put together there. That's very, very impressive um, when you think about the medal haul that we saw from China um, and what we what we didn't see for the British crews, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, just a word for the lightweight doubles. The Kiwis, uh, would they pick up four gold medals? Women's eight, women's pair, women's double skull, women's lightweight doubles. I think the McBride yeah. won that. And, of course, the Irish, um, O'Donovan with uh, Fintan McCarthy, Paul O'Donovan. Yeah. Um, just it, it occurs to me it's not cast iron certain the, the 2021 Olympics are going to happen. Yeah. I was talking to Paul Thompson about this and he said, um, you know, we, we, we're trying to have, you know, some races, internal races in China, but the travel in China isn't, isn't set and you'll have to have international travel back. So I, I'm, I'm just wondering if we're not, if we're going to have seen the last of men's lightweight doubles at the Olympics, if this Olympic, what's your thought if the Olympics is going to go ahead or looks likely to go ahead or? I mean, I think we're getting into very big, big questions there. Um, I mean, we've got to hope that the Olympics will go ahead in 2021. Um, I think the bigger picture question for me is, is that one that for me came into, 
to real focus uh, the year before in uh, in in 2018 when we were in Bulgaria um, and Thomas Bach came over yeah. and talked to the talked to rowing really talked to the heads of all the teams about the fact that rowing in its current form doesn't fit the mold for the Olympics um, and by that I think he was saying uh, six minute races that all look more or less the same um, is yeah. not the model which we want to have going forward. And we then start getting into the conversations about whether it's shorter distances um, or whether it's coastal um, style rowing or anything else that makes our sport look different and, and more easy to consume um, by the watching public who aren't necessarily men in their 50s but it's, what are you saying you know, it's young and men you, you know it's, it's young boys and girls who, who who want to be inspired by what they can watch and where the rowing is right for that and to me that's a bigger question of which the whole lightweights of the olympics is all just part of that yeah it is isn't it and um uh, you know just hope and pray that those games are gonna find some way to go ahead in 2021 um I think it would be, I mean, the Irish team, we mentioned Sunita Prospura already, but, um, you know, the Irish men's double skull just sort of behind those those Chinese for silver medal uh, last year. And then, of course, the Irish men's lightweight double getting a gold medal. I mean, what a phenomenal race. Uh, what yeah. a phenomenal record for a, a small nation. And, and actually, compared to Britain, with you know the bronze medal from the lightweight women's double in the Olympic class event and the bronze medal from the four, the bronze medal from the eight. I mean, it doesn't really stand comparison. No, it's very impressive what they've done with the Irish team. And I suppose what it's showing is if you have a small number of athletes and you put a lot of resources into them, what you can get out rather than the approach that Team GB went for, which was to go for lots of qualification and getting lots of athletes there, but whether you actually then spread your support a little bit too thinly, um, and it's a real mission to be able to do both, which is why I think the the performance of the Irish is special. Um, that, like you say, with limited resources and limited numbers of athletes, they did so well. And then you look at the teams like China and particularly like New Zealand, where they were able to do both, yeah, a big team and big medals. Uh, Greg, I've, I've got one little treat, which I think, I don't know, again, if my technology is going to be up to it. But, um, you know, you talked over that 2012 race. I'm sure you must have done this a long while. I think I've got your Barcelona pairs race. OK. Um, I think, and I well, think I'm, it's a thousand. Yeah, go on. I won't talk over it this time. I'll just enjoy it. Um, yeah. Um, Lafrin has said it would be a shame to lose lightweight rowing. The millionaire sports such as golf, football and basketball should be dropped in favour of the amateur sport. I think, you know, Luff, I, I'd say, um, I, you know, I've kind of been there. I've been in the room with a former head of the IOC, Samaranch, to say tennis shouldn't be in the Olympics. And he looked at me like I was, he was very nice until then. He looked at me like I was a piece of dirt. You know, I was so out of touch with what was in his mind. And I think the IOC are just looking at sports like golf and, and football and and basketball, they'll never drop them. I don't think they will. I mean, I think if there's anything that's going on in lockdown right now, it's interesting to me looking at the rise of esports um, and how entertaining young people find esports. Mm. Um, that to sit and watch someone, you know, the Fortnite World Championships happened. Um, it's massive prize money, massive following. Um, and it was good to watch. You know, it was good to watch. Yeah. And there's a 15 year old boy doing, you know, performing moves with a character that 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 look as good as watching, you know, Lionel Messi with a football. Um, people want to watch that. You yeah. Know, people, because they they tried it and they can't do it, and this person can. Um, and I think we have to recognise we're in a, a you know we're in competition for attention with things like that, rather than thinking. You know, we're in competition with sports like like golf and and, and tennis necessarily because those things aren't going. 
it's what's new that's coming and it's skateboarding and it's break dancing and it's climbing and thinking how does how does rowing stack up against those okay so great feel free to talk through this rose because i think you know um the guys listening i had my sound down actually because i didn't want to hear the the commentary but um if this works, we'll try and get you talking through the last thousand metres of that race. Just give us an insight, Greg. You did you win your heat and qualify direct? Uh, yes, yes, but there were semi-finals, so we'd won our heat um, when we raced the Romanians, who were the silver medalists the previous year. Um, they'd led us, and we'd come through in the last few strokes, um, last hundred or so. We got through the Romanians. Um, then we'd had a good semi-final where we got in the lead about halfway um, and beat the Germans who got the bronze the previous year. So it's us and the Italians are in three and four with the Romanians and the Germans in two and five and then the Cubans and French on the outsides. OK, well, let's let's see how that goes. Um, if this is going to work. Than the bare minimum to qualify. As older men, they know that they have got a limited number of. Can you see that, Greg? I can hear Chris Bailey, but I can't see it. Can you see it? I can see it. That may, we may be outdone by the technology there. Well, you can let it run. If people can watch it, then you can watch it. I know what happened. I can see it, but I, it, it occurs to me that uh, those that we're those that we're talking to won't be able to see it. So I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm just going to yeah, try yeah, another so. another window to see if it works. Okay. Um, it's, it's always an exciting race to watch. I think it was very exciting uh, being with you. Uh, Greg, uh, going round um, Banyolis when the World Cup was there in 2009, was it? Yeah, and I think that was, what yeah, was that when you first got me back involved with commentary, wasn't it? Yeah, um, that's right. And the World, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the World Cup went to Banyolis and it was so lovely to see the village, um, which we'd stayed in back in 92, now just fully populated and integrated within the town of Banyolas. So my technology is let's see. Uh, witnessing the birth of a new era in So, um, still not coming up as a share, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm just going to try and share, just going to try and do it one more time with a different. Um, oh, this looks good. Can you yeah, see something? Yeah. Can you see this, Greg? Um, I can see it. A group of videos, and it looks like you've started one. And at the moment, it's still small, the same size as all the others. Oh, it's, it sounds like we're on the start. Italy in the lead. Can you make it full size? Because at the moment, it needs to be made big. It's that one there, isn't it? Your float. Your yeah, 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 yeah. We need that yeah. to be full screen. I've I've got it full screen on my laptop. It it kind of goes into a different. Um, this looks different, like um, the this looks like the 2012 race looked when you played it from here, but then it went full screen. Whereas this isn't going full screen. Yeah. In terms of them as quickly as they can, it's a good two lengths. Now that would have cost the Italians a great deal. Can you see that? Yeah. No, I mean it might be it might be visible in the bottom of the screen, but it's not filling the screen, and I can't even see I can't see enough to see whether that's full size down there. Towards a thousand meters, the final of the men's can't see that. Can hear it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm I'm just gonna try it one more time. Gone through a thousand 
Uh, again, this looks good, but it's not coming. Did you see that? Yes, you've done it. Yes, okay, done good. Come Go for it. Thousand meters. So we're coming towards a thousand somewhere. Um, so we're in the blue and white ailings boat. Um, here we go, nice close up. We're going along at about 39 strokes a minute because um, that seemed to work for us. We we really eased our gearing to let us be much more flexible with our speed. So we weren't that surprised that the Italians were quicker than us. And at this point, I still thought we were right on top of them because um, I was, again, looking in the boat. I was aware that the... Uh, Romanians were here just to our left. And I was thinking, well, that's pretty good. Um, that's where they were in the heat. And the Italians are a little bit ahead of the Romanians. But obviously, I had no idea it was this far. And I don't ever normally watch it this far back. So it's amazing just seeing how far behind we were. I mean, you can see here, I mean, I guess their gearing is so much heavier. And you can see, I mean, they're going a long way every stroke. But it starts to look like they just can't change gear at all. And they're rowing through treacle um, as we come into the last 500 here, whereas we're so dynamic. We did a push at, at um, 12.50, where we brought the rate up as well. Um, so we tried to do 30 strokes with sort of 10 where we pulled harder, 10 where we took the rate up, and then 10 where we pulled harder again. Um, so that would have taken us through to about here. And I think from that point, quite early, we made quite a big move on the Italians. Um, and from that point onwards, instead of them going faster than us, we're definitely going faster than them. I mean, again, I really thought we were closing the gap on them fast now. And I guess we are closing the gap, but, you know, what was a length and a half of clear water is still half a length of clear water. Oh, you'll like this, Mark. We passed um, the Canadian women's here, the women's end <laughs> yeah. here, and I heard them cheering for us. I think you, they're all going, go Gary, because they all love Gary. It's the crazy distance behind with, with 200 metres, Greg. Yeah, and this was just everything that we trained for, everything we planned to do. We were just stepping this up. I can't remember quite how we did it. Probably four tens. Like for the last 250 was going to be 40 strokes in 250 metres. And it was just Gary calling 10 and then go again, up and go again for 10. I mean, I remember trying to row long. You know, rowing long is always important, but taking the rate up is important. And just holding our length here. I mean, you can't really see, but the Italians just have absolutely nothing. You know, they don't raise their rate. They just don't do it. They have no response. And if you look, us, you know, the Romanians almost beat them for silver because they're so slow at the end. And then actually, Martin, let it run a little bit longer because I do the worst celebration in history. Look, Johnny and Gary do really lovely celebrations. Like, look at that. That's really cool. And then this is so bad. Since the Cox came out of the mist to win the gold medal, eight years ago. That was nice to watch. The vital one to take the cells out of the eight and leave them in the pair. It has all been. So, um, Greg, got um, a question from Luke who's listening in. He says, 39 strokes a minute, so effectively you rode the Cox pair in a similar pattern to the current race profile of the high 30s rather than 2000, early 2010s into the yeah. mid 30s. What would you say about that? Interesting question. No, really interesting question. I think we, we'd come out of the eight um, where we would have tried to go over at about 38, 39. Um, when we first got in the Cox pair, we tried to do it like everyone else and we just couldn't make an impression really. Um, so we, yeah, we just eased the gearing more and more to give ourselves that flexibility to change pace. So effectively, we just thought about being really dynamic, about using our, what can I say, using our fitness, our heart and lungs 
Um, whereas the Abignales were going to use their muscles. Yeah. But we were only 20 and 23 and we didn't have very big muscles. So for us, it was about, you know, being dynamic. I used to do loads of box jumps, you know, real plyometric kind of training. Um, and so to do, you know, to, to, to row a pair in that way, I think you have to be really elastic and dynamic. And I don't think you get that from doing loads of rowing around rate 19. I think you do that from practicing being dynamic. And we had the freedom to do that kind of training, which allowed us to have that change of pace. Yeah, do you? It's an interesting question. I think you know we'll probably come to the end of our our chat shortly. But um, do you? How do you relate to that race? Does it still define you as a person, or have you gone into the sort of you know the double Olympian sort of twenty uh, twenty twelve back from ninety two? I mean, how do you relate to it now? Um, I would say it defines me as a person. Um, to be an Olympic gold medalist. Um, and I loved all the other races, um, but, you know, I loved that one more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just, you know, it's just very, very special to be, there's, there's not many races in my life, there's not many things in your life where you feel there's no higher level to get to. So yeah. To have, have won the Olympics, stood in the middle of the rostrum and got given the gold medal felt very, very complete. You know, rowing felt complete. And it was funny to to feel complete age 20. Um, I mean, for you, what, it was age 27? Yeah. Um, and, and then and then to then go again, because that's what I did. Um, but it, yeah, and so in terms of the, the impact on my life, it's very special to be able to know that I'm okay with rowing. You know, I'm okay with rowing. And that helps me be okay with myself. Um, um, whatever else happens. So we've got two questions, Greg. That was meant to be a kind of concluding question, but Greg uh, Specht, I, Greg, and Cameron Keelty. Greg asks, do you see the field for the men's single in 2021? Is there anyone who can catch Ollie Zeidler? Huh. So just, well, to, just to remind you, I mean, I'm, I've, I think I've got the... Um, it was Zeidler, 644.55, Nielsen, 644.56, Borsch, Kettle Borsch, 644.64, Risconi, 645 in fourth place, Stefan Bruyning, 645. Bruyning's only a second behind Zeidler, and Andre Sinek's the one out the back. Yeah. So in terms of the question, do I see anyone else? Um, I think Oli Zeidler's improving. I mean, he's the guy who's newest to the event. So you would have thought another two years should help him um, and therefore make him harder to catch. But, I mean, that was an absolutely incredible race to, to have the privilege of commentating yeah, on yeah. and to watch. It would have been incredible to be in. And it just shows if they, if they all stay anywhere near that level, you, you, you can't say who's going to be winning no. at this stage. Um, and who knows, you know, who knows what might happen with Mahe, um, you know, whether the British can find a scholar who can get in there and contend as well. Because when you look at people like Grisconis, you know, he's been around the field, but you wouldn't expect him to be up there in that way, which says given another, you know, two years on from there, there's a, there's a heck of a lot that can happen in that field. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'd be backing Oli Ziegler at this point, but who knows? And um, Cameron Kilty is... Asked the question, <coughs> dear to both our hearts, probably, can you give an insight into what it was like to row for Harry Marr? Oh, oh, what a lovely last question. Um, it felt um, like you got more out putting the same or less in. <laughs> and isn't that just perfect? Yeah. That, you know, we work so hard and you think more is more is better. Um, to suddenly row with Harry and go, actually, you know, why are you, why are you pulling so hard with your arms? <laughs> you <know? laughs> Just relax those arms. Let them move quickly. Um, you know, why, why do you have to go to the gym and lift those big heavy weights? Why don't you be a bit more dynamic? <laughs> kind of float a bit more. Don't make the boat so heavy in the water. You know, those sorts of things are just magical. Um, and to work with someone who could, who could give you real... Um, insight and real really let you feel the experience for yourself as well 
So it means yeah. to feel the experience of trying something and noticing myself getting a positive return for it was was very special. Yeah. Um, so yeah. What about you, Martin? Well, <clears throat> I came to to Harry late in my career. So in terms of times he coached me in the boat, um, I only sort of two or three times in the single, he'd say, you know, similar things to what you've just said. But I, you know, looked at the crews he was coaching, the great New Zealand eights um, <clears throat> of 82 and 83, men's four that was inspired by him, the 2000 Olympic eight, and, and you that year in 97. And I could see what he was looking for, that sort of endless fluidity and flow, um, <clears throat> pure pure dynamic sporting movement, but with a naturalness to it that, that never looked out of place. And, um, you know, he, he once told me of, because um, Harry used to like running, he was, he was running around uh, the lake at Lucerne, kind of, I guess, you know, pretty ploy. Well, he was quite a decent runner, Harry. And he yeah. just felt this this sort of sensation next to him and he's, it was a Kenyan and he said he went past me and it was almost like his feet weren't touching the floor he was just ghosting along and he yeah. was using that as an example of the kind of movement that he wanted in rowing yeah no um, and that's that's so great isn't it when you can find that sort of movement and find that sort of efficiency of the Kenyan runner um but apply that apply that to a rowing boat and the other thing that I think what he bought was he loved it. You know, he loved it. He used to coach me for a bit and then he would turn around and just coach someone else. Because he didn't, you know, he'd had about enough of coaching me. We'd been looking at each other for long enough. And he just loved helping people get faster at this sport, which was, which was, you know, really special. Yeah. So I'm going to end the live broadcast now. I'm going to say um, goodbye to you all. Um, I'm not going to say goodbye to Greg. I'm going to ask Greg just to stay there. But it's been great. You joined us. Catch up again. Watch this. It'll be on YouTube. But it's been a blast the last uh, hour or so. Yeah, thanks. Nice to talk to you, Martin, and everyone else. Cheers. So that 